there's something going on here. I'll represent it here with this pyramid. I think one way of thinking about this Christian cosmology is as a multi-level pyramid with God at the top of it. And as we ascend, both a chain of being and a chain of desire, we find ourselves approaching more and more this pinnacle. So down here in terms of beings, kept the bugs and your insects, your viruses, your bacteria, up here perhaps animals, primates, human beings, right? Maybe a couple of levels below God. In terms of being, in terms of mind, each of these things seems to be more comprehensive at a different level. As I get up closer to the top, me several layers below the top, I'm able to think about and to comprehend myself, my position in the whole, and the existence of the whole. Talked before about understanding the divine also as an element of understanding the entire cosmos as a unity. The thing to know about this world picture though is that it takes its cues from the being, the pinnacle being, the top being. Everything is what it is in relation to its rise towards God, towards the being that is ultimately good. God, goodness, being, and truth. This Christian cosmology I'll put it this way. I'm going to erase partially as well because I need more space. One of the most fundamental facts about this Christian cosmology is that being and unity come first. They are primordial, so to speak. They were from the beginning. It is evil and disorder that follow later on as a later step in the story. You have to have creation before you can have corruption, which means that it is goodness and God, ultimately, that is the fundamental reality. Maybe that's the way I should put it here. God is the fundamental reality. I suggested in the video about section 11 that we might place this up against a sort of sketched out Darwinian or post-Darwinian cosmology. You can think about the way in which Darwin's reflections on evolution challenge this worldview. And I thought I'd say a word or two about this. One, because it's inherently interesting. Two, because I think understanding a system is easier to do in light of its critics or some of its main critics. And third, because I think Boethius explicitly addresses this, although not in a strictly Darwinian form, on um, page 95. So I'd like to turn to that really briefly. Um, before, let me, before I do that, let me say a word about unity. He does say in section 11, all things desire unity, all things are oriented towards unity and towards God. That's part of what I mean by talking about this, the sort of unity that comes at the top of the pyramid is the orientation of all these other things. Each of these things, one might say, in a liturgical sense, each of these things glorifies God in its own way by being what it is. More about that in a minute when I talk about nature. What's this rival Darwinian cosmology? I said, here's, here's a sort of Christian cosmology. Let me call this a post-Darwinian cosmology, a world picture that we might build out of some Darwinian insights. And I think one possible post-Darwinian cosmology, as I should say, A, this is not the only one, Rather than saying that being in unity is first and that God created everything beneath here and orients it towards himself and draws it back to himself, 
was a sort of circular motion here, right? God sort of throws being out away from him by creating it, but he's also implanted it with the principles that bring it around back to him at the end of all things. Okay. The unity and perfection of things, finally, through the reunion with God. Here, we might say chaos and multiplicity are primordial. We don't begin with order. We don't begin with divinity. We begin with the sort of booming, buzzing confusion of life. Life okay. erupts. And it erupts in many forms. There are no fixed patterns. Goes this world picture. What we do have, though, it's the process of natural selection over deep time, as one, uh, one advocate expresses it. Natural selection plus time produces produces a seeming order. Things seem to be orderly. They seem to be arranged in a certain fashion. Goes this post-Darwinian world picture, but it's only a, only a semblance of order because it is unstable and constantly changing. That's just the fact that your lifetime is so short relative to the deep time over which evolution takes place that there seem to you to be sort of fixed things called zebras and giraffes and um, water lilies, whatever they are. Um, they only seem to be fixed in place relative to your short lifespan. If we look at them over the, over the standpoint of millions of years, they are, it seems, constantly evolving in response to selective pressures from their environment. Change the environment, the selective pressures change, the animals over time, the entire species, changes if it survives. So to survive is to be adapted to your environment. So far, this is all just sort of very general. You guys are familiar with this or have encountered something like this before, okay? I'm not, I'm, this is, I'm gonna, do the philosopher thing. I'm going to raise a challenge and a question that I'm not going to resolve in this class. This is maybe material for a later class until 203 or perhaps um, if I get to do my philosophy of science or a Darwin course here in a future year, one of you guys can sign up for it. You're more than welcome to. So here, chaos and multiplicity is primary. It's the order and even the semblance of order that is secondary. There is no divine intelligence that has ordered things and that sort of draws things back to itself. I mentioned one of the reasons I wanted to consider this is because I think Boethius raises it and rejects it, among other places, on page 95, considering the, considering the nature of plants. He says, as, as Lady Philosophy say, if you think about plants and trees, you see they grow in the places that are suitable for them where so far as nature allows, they can grow and thrive and avoid withering and dying. Some grow in fields and others on mountains, etc. If they were transplanted to a place you and I think of as likelier for vegetation, they would die. So here's an interesting note. Each plant is, seems, to be, seems to live in the environment to which it is well suited. Lady Philosophy suggests here, this shows the sort of perfection of the divine order. God chose to plant cactuses in the desert or to give the desert plants the sort of features that cactuses have that allow them to thrive in the desert. What the Darwinian picture at least opens the door on is the way of saying, no, actually, the fact that cactuses live in the desert does not indicate some kind of divine order and perfection. It simply indicates that natural selection has killed off everything else that tried to live in the desert that didn't have these cactus-like features. Okay. So the world as it turns out, one of the fundamental turns, I think, in, in Darwin's theory is that nature is really much bloodier and more, has a much higher casualty rate than we might otherwise think, okay? It is not a case where most things live and the occasional odd one dies. It's a case where most things are just ruthlessly murdered by their environment or by predators, by things around them. And the ones that survive are, are the minority, the very tiny minority that we see. They seem to be well adapted to their environment only because nature has been so ruthless in culling all the ones that were even slightly maladapted to their environment. What I'm doing here is highly speculative and I just wanted to set out the possibility of 
putting these two world pictures into competition with each other and to me asking perhaps for uh, those of us defending a Christian cosmology, how do you respond to, how do you, how do you begin to respond to the philosophical foundations of and arguments of that Darwinian, post-Darwinian worldview? Uh, I'm going to raise that without resolving it because I think it's material for a modern philosophy class. One of the things we'll take a look at next class when we talk about Aristotle's four causes is the presence of natures or formal causes and the presence of purposes or final causes in natural beings. Those are both things that a Darwinian account, a post-Darwinian account of the natural world raises challenges to. And again, I can only hear raise challenges without addressing them completely.